This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. You may have heard people call places like the Amazon rainforest the lungs of the planet because of the huge amounts of photosynthesis that happen there, producing the oxygen that we breathe. But all of the rainforests on Earth only produce about 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. The ocean produces 70%. For example, one species of ocean-dwelling cyanobacteria called Prochlorococcus marinus is responsible for more oxygen production than all of the rainforests on the entire planet combined. It's literally the smallest photosynthetic microorganism on Earth, and there are over three octillion, that's three billion 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 of them, in the world's oceans, and they alone produce over 20% of the oxygen that we breathe. So the ocean as a whole is incredibly important, but in terms of the most important parts of the ocean, coral reefs take the cake. They are, without a shadow of a doubt, the most productive and the most diverse parts of the ocean. Coral reefs account for less than 1% of the ocean, and yet they contain over 25% of all marine biodiversity. They are basically the marine equivalent of the rainforest. In fact, coral reefs contain all the same phyla that you would expect to find in the rainforest. Angiosperms, arthropods, chordates, mollusks, brachiopods, cnidarians, and also echinoderms, which have no freshwater or terrestrial species, so coral reefs actually have a phylum that rainforests don't. Not to mention the fact that just like rainforests, coral reefs are the medicine cabinets of the planet. The plants and animals that can only be found there are sources of new medical treatments for things like Alzheimer's and arthritis and bacterial and viral infections and even cancer. Coral reefs also protect human lives and property by forming a barrier against storms and erosion that would otherwise destroy the coastline. They provide food and jobs for hundreds of millions of people. They clean and oxygenate the water around them, increasing the clarity and quality of the water closer to the coast. In biology, we call the benefits that an ecosystem provides to humanity ecosystem services, and we've already covered quite a few. Regulating air or water quality, protecting against natural hazards, providing food or resources or medicines, supporting neighboring ecosystems through nutrient cycling, and participating in biogeochemical cycles, or even just creating an economic benefit through tourism and recreation. Despite the fact that coral reefs make up less than one half of 1% of the total surface of the Earth, the ecosystem services they provide directly benefit well over a billion people worldwide, and indirectly benefit you as well. Here's the problem though. Coral reefs are in sharp decline, and they have been for a long time. That's a big problem for all of us. Fortunately, as always, there are great scientists out there who are stepping up to the challenge to try to save these priceless ecosystems. And I wanted to meet those people. So I headed to the University of the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas to visit their Center for Marine and Environmental Studies. I first met with Dr. Marilyn Brandt, the director of the university's Reef Response and Coral Restoration Program, and Dr. Sam Elitis, the director of research and conservation at the Coral World Ocean and Reef Initiative, which works alongside the university. One of the ways that these researchers are helping to restore coral populations is through a process called microfragmentation. Simply put, they chop the coral into little pieces on a bandsaw and then glue those little pieces to individual pucks so they can all grow separately. This may sound pretty brutal, but the reason for it actually makes a lot of sense. When you cut these coral up, it triggers an immune response that leads to rapid tissue growth, the same way that your body would grow tissue rapidly to heal a cut. Microfragmentation increases the surface area of that tissue growth, which means 20 small fragmented coral pieces will grow a lot more in a lot shorter time than one big unfragmented coral. So this water right here goes into these tanks right here. Yes, it does. Amazing. Through this process, these scientists can grow these coral to a size that would normally take years to reach in just a matter of months. And that's incredibly important considering the fact that coral reproduction is based on size, not age. Depending on the species, corals can be male or female or both. They can reproduce internally or externally. They can reproduce sexually or asexually. But no matter how they do it, they will not make more of themselves until they're big enough to do so. 
So the overall goal is to get these corals up to reproductive size so that they can be transplanted back out into reefs and increase the population. The best survivors can even be refragmented to grow even more and spread the population even further later on. They seem to do well once they hit around three centimeter size. They're good to go out on the reef and they'll survive just fine on their own. I thought that was a crab hanging on. It is. It is. Oh my god. This is a little crab that we keep in here. You can see we have snails all over the place as well. Right. And these are mostly herbivorous, uh, so they'll generally focus on just cleaning up all the algae that's growing in and around the corals. Cheaper than grad students? Much cheaper than grad students. People are going corals. to ask, does he have a name? You can call him Reggie. <laughs> All right, cool. And when you think about that from an evolutionary perspective, it makes this whole thing that much cooler. Because this process relies on the same kind of artificial selection that we use in agriculture to make bigger and more nutritious foods to make coral populations that are more resistant to things like climate change, pollution, and disease. This is what we do 95% of the day. <laughs> yeah, so if you like brushing your teeth and listening to podcasts and washing your hands, this is a good job for you. But the corals don't just grow in these long raceway tanks forever. Once they get big enough, they can be taken out into these huge underwater racks so they can be exposed to the open ocean and grow more naturally. As the fragments become big and healthy, they can be placed together onto one big puck where they'll grow back together into one large mass that's much closer to reproductive size and much more likely to survive when it's put back out on the reef. However, there is one caveat to this process that sounds pretty obvious when you think about it, but I still found particularly cool. All of the fragments that get put back together have to be genotypically identical. They have to have the same DNA. If they have different DNA, they won't grow back together. They'll fight and kill and eat each other. The edges of different corals within the same reef are battlefields. They're constantly competing with each other for space and resources, just like any other animal would. Oh, by the way, did I mention that corals are animals? That freaks so many people out, and I don't know why. Corals are animals, y'all. There's one other thing about this that isn't super related to this video, but I can't not tell you. I mentioned that some coral species reproduce externally. That's called broadcast spawning. Basically just sperm and eggs being spewed into the water at random so they can meet whenever they just bump into each other. The embryos that are created from this process then develop into larvae at the surface of the water. And this is the only mobile stage of the coral's life. They swim around until they find a nice little spot to chill, and then they lock in and they never move again. Why do I bring this up when this is only one of the many methods of coral reproduction? Because these spawning events can be so large that they create what's called a slick, a pinkish mass of coral gametes and larvae on the surface of the water that can be so big that you can see them from space. How wonderfully gross is that? Also, because when corals spawn this way, most of those embryos end up getting gobbled up by zooplankton, another strategy that these researchers are using is to go and scoop up all of those excess embryos, keep them safe until they develop into larvae, and then transplant them into less populated reefs. They're rescuing the homeless coral babies. That's great! Just down the hill from Dr. Brandt's team, Dr. Robin Smith is working with brain coral cross-fertilizing populations from all corners of the island that would normally never have a chance to reproduce together in order to create new genetic combinations that will hopefully have a better chance of survival. His team is also challenging the idea that the microfragmentation process we talked about before is the best way to restore these coral reefs. I mentioned that when you cut these coral up, it creates an immune response that leads to rapid tissue growth, but that rapid tissue growth only applies to soft tissue, and it comes at the expense of calcification or skeletal growth. And that's an issue, because the skeletons that coral grow are the structures upon which the next generation of coral will live. 
They don't just live in the reefs, they are the reefs. You can take a core sample of a coral reef and find dozens of overlapping skeletons from different species of coral going back centuries. So if Dr. Smith's suspicions are correct, that would mean that the microfragmentation process is making more animal, but not enough skeleton for the animal to hold onto. So the next big hurricane that blows through is just gonna wash all that new coral away. That would be bad. So this team is testing just how long and how severely calcification is reduced after microfragmentation. Because if skeletal growth is being put on pause for too long, this conservation method might not be as worth it as we think. And that is one of my favorite things about scientists. They're not just out here doing this amazing work, they're challenging and critiquing and testing the methods that they're doing the amazing work in order to make it all that more amazing. Several of these species are endangered. So that's why we take the excruciating care that we do with, you know, hand feeding them, um, giving them vitamins, checking on their health every day because every single one of these um, represents one of the last of its species. There are a couple other things about coral that I haven't covered yet, but I think are important for you to know. First of all, corals are members of the phylum Snidaria, which means just like all other Snidarians, like jellyfish for example, they contain stinging cells called nematocysts. Most coral can't hurt you, but there are some species, like fire coral for example, that can sting you quite badly and leave you with a painful rash that can last for weeks. Another important thing to know is that when we talk about coral, we're actually talking about lots and lots of little itty bitty organisms all living together at once. Each one of these little spots is what's called a polyp, a whole animal in and of itself. And any individual coral can be made up of countless hundreds of these polyps all living together as one organismal mass. We call this type of organism colonial a colony of physically connected and functionally interdependent individuals or subunits. The Portuguese man of war is a great example of a colonial organism. Lots of little animals with specialized jobs all working together to create a whole new animal. As for the researchers at UVI, this just makes their job that much more difficult because each of those individual coral polyps eventually will want a snack. Oh my glob, I love that Look so that. much. Nom, nom. Each of the coral polyps contains a type of algae known as zooxanthellae that live inside of it as an endosymbiont. Remember, endosymbiosis is where one organism lives inside of another organism. And if you want to learn more about that, check out episode 4 of my Light of Evolution series. These endosymbiotic algae produce most of the nutrition and oxygen that the coral needs to survive. Which means that even though coral are animals, they produce the oxygen that they and the ecosystem around them need, like plants. You know, it's kind of amazing to think about that relationship between the algae and the coral and these tiny little animals that grow and grow over millennia, that relationship is what builds these huge structures that you can see from space in some cases, right? So just this tiny little like roommate relationship defines entire ecosystems on the planet. So it's just, that's kind of what inspires me. The symbiotic nature of coral, along with the fact that they can't just get up and move, makes them particularly susceptible to pollution and climate change. When the conditions in which they live change dramatically, be it the light exposure or the temperature or the nutrient content of the water around them, they can lose their algal symbionts in a process called bleaching because eventually they turn white. For example, in 2005, the United States lost half of all of its coral reefs in the Caribbean in one single massive bleaching event caused by a dramatic change in water temperature more severe than the past 20 years combined. This was the most extreme bleaching event ever recorded in the region. You may have also noticed that corals are often so brightly colored that they sometimes appear to glow under the water. This is because corals produce mycosporine-like amino acids that act as a sort of a built-in sunscreen for them by reflecting excess UV radiation and making them look shiny. So as the coral is exposed to environmental stressors and bleaching progresses, the polyps contain less and less algal symbionts, so more and more of those reflective amino acids are exposed, meaning that the coral glows more brightly up until the point that it dies. Visually speaking, it's probably the most beautiful form of death in the animal kingdom. Now corals can sometimes survive the bleaching process and slowly regain their algal symbionts, but even when that happens, they just underwent a seriously stressful situation and lost a lot of energy, which means they are much more susceptible to disease. 
So the solution to this problem isn't as simple as just removing the environmental stressor. These reefs need ongoing protection as well. Another major problem for coral reefs is ocean acidification. Here I've got some water mixed with a pH indicator, so it's nice and blue like the ocean. Watch what happens when I add just a few drops of acid, and very quickly this water goes from nice deep blue to sort of a sickly yellowish green. But nobody's out there dumping acid into the ocean, right? Except we kind of are. Let's try that experiment again, only this time instead of pouring in acid, I'm just going to blow in a bunch of carbon dioxide. Watch what happens. right back to a gross greenish yellow. This right here is called carbonic acid. It's made by mixing carbon dioxide and water, and it kills coral reefs by limiting coral's ability to grow properly and by making their skeletons more brittle. The more carbon dioxide we release into the atmosphere, the more it mixes with the seawater, and the more carbonic acid is created, and the more the oceans become acidic, and the more coral die. And the worst part is, the carbon dioxide that doesn't mix with the seawater is still in the atmosphere, which contributes to rising ocean temperatures, which still kills coral! And just to be clear, warming oceans causing thermal stress and ocean acidification reducing the structural integrity of reefs is just two of the many problems that corals face as a result of climate change. Warmer oceans also spread pathogens faster. Sea level rise increases sedimentation, which smothers coral. Changes in storm patterns lead to the destruction of reef structures. Changes in precipitation leads to the runoff of land-based pollutants. Algal blooms consume nutrients and obscure much-needed sunlight. And altered ocean currents change food dispersal pathways. All of these things kill coral reefs, which, as we mentioned at the beginning, are not just pretty, but are increasingly important sources of food, protection, medical treatments, nutritional supplements, cosmetics, pesticides, scientific understanding, and oh yeah, oxygen. Not to mention the fact that pollution and climate change negatively impact all marine organisms, including photosynthetic microorganisms like Prochlorococcus. Remember this little guy? The guy that makes 20% of the air you're breathing right now? And that is why programs like the one at the University of the Virgin Islands are so important. And before I left, I had the privilege of seeing the benefits of this work, as several of the faculty members took me out to the small keys just off the island to visit the reefs and see them growing and teeming with life. One thing that didn't really fit in this video, but I wanted to mention anyway, is that the university also has an amazing sea turtle rescue and conservation program. And while I'm sorry to report that I didn't get to participate in that, at least not this time, I did get the chance to head over to the beach next door and try to catch a peek at a few turtles while they grazed on seagrass. Seagrass is low in protein, so they need to eat an awful lot of it in order to get the nutrition that they need. And there are actually a few different species of seagrass around the island, some native and some invasive. Part of the university's sea turtle research is finding out which one provides more nutritional value and which one the turtles prefer. As of right now, it looks like the native seagrass is more protein rich, and sure enough, the turtles tend to flock to it. As for me, I didn't think to collect any samples, I was just happy to hang out with these dudes while they had lunch.
Just a couple of decades ago, so many people were building hotels right on the beaches and eating the eggs and the meat from these turtles that these creatures were very close to extinction. But thanks to conservation and research efforts from the university, they're making a strong comeback. One unexpected part of that is the runway of the airport on the island. These funky-shaped concrete wave breakers are called dolos, and they create a complex underwater structure that's great for young turtles to hide from predators, and perfect for sponges to grow. And sponges are the main food source for the critically endangered hawksbill turtles that live around the island. It's like a concrete mangrove, and it's doing great work for the turtles, and we didn't even build it that way on purpose, and that's so cool to me. The idea that we can build our society in a way that has a minimal impact, or maybe even a positive effect on the ecosystems around us, and that it's so easy to do that we did it here by accident, is so inspiring. I am immensely grateful to the University of the Virgin Islands for having me out to talk about the incredible work that they're doing. They did not pay me in any way for this video, they have not asked me to promote them. But I did get the chance to talk to the director of the Center for Marine and Environmental Studies, Dr. Paul Jobsis, and he let me know of all the ways that this program is so much cooler than I had already thought. We have had humpbacks, uh, whales giving birth here, we've had whale sharks coming into this area, uh, we've had uh, manta rays, uh, we've had, we have spotted eagle rays all the time, and literally people give us a call like, there's a whale shark out there, and we all run and <laughs> hit the water. This uh, is what we're calling a coral bot. It is an autonomous vehicle. It can actually learn to spot diseases, so it can learn to spot this coral tissue loss disease and document where it is. The University of the Virgin Islands is a historically black college and university. It's the only HBCU that has a beach on the campus. This is an oceanographic glider. We have a grant to put hydrophones in there, so we'll be able to identify different whale calls, and then we're gonna get basically an idea of the whales in the area just by listening for them. That's our newest dorm. You can see they all overlook Brewer's Bay. Oh, wow. So they've got this amazing view. We literally have our undergraduate students doing research that I was not able to do until I was a graduate student. If I ever want to do a third master's, I'm coming here. Like, it sounds so cool too. <laughs> so if you want to look into this program for your own educational endeavors, or if you want to learn more about research or volunteer opportunities in coral restoration or sea turtle rescue, or if you just want to find out how you can help out this university, I'll put all the links you need in the description below. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff we do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye. Hey there, it's me again from The Thing You Just Watched. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. If you're like me, you love learning. So much that sometimes it actually starts to get in the way of other parts of your life because you just can't stop studying all the time. And when you go too long without learning new stuff, you start to feel physically uncomfortable, like your organs are trying to break out of your body. And so you just start kicking because you're just so full of energy and anxiety because you just know that there's something out there just waiting to be learned and you're wasting your life not learning it right now. That's why I love Brilliant. It ensures that even if I'm not in school or reading a good book, I can still build my knowledge and hone my skills in math and science with fun, interactive daily lessons. Brilliant offers courses for all learners at all levels, with topics ranging from engineering to data analysis to programming to physics and beyond. And with their guided bite-sized lessons, it's easy to stay motivated and keep exploring. If you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, you can do so by going to brilliant.org slash or using the link in the description below. 
and the first 200 of you that do will get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. Brilliant is built for busy people, so if you feel like life has forced you to put your quest for science on hold, this is your opportunity to get started again. So just head on over to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai, take a look around, and maybe give it a try. Worst case scenario, you've lost absolutely nothing because it's a 30-day free trial. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, thanks so much to my patrons on Patreon for their continued support, and thank you so much for watching. See you later! Did you see that, that Dan, award show she did where she just shouted okay. out like all of these activists that were like more uh, deserving of recognition? There, though, so that freaking one pop up with that so, so, I've never listen, had it. I would oh, be like, this is what I brought. Yeah, I just watched the... Yeah, riding in a car.